God bless you and good evening, beloved. God bless each of you and thank you for taking the time to, to listen to some of the things that uh, the Lord is sharing with me to share with you. Um, I don't foresee this going long, but I've often been wrong about that, but I don't, I don't foresee this actually going long. I really want to jump right into what it is that the Lord has laid uh, upon my heart. <clears throat> I'm going to read you some scriptures, some verses of scripture, and we're going to come from 1 John, the third chapter. Here's where the word of the Lord will find us this evening. There are really some other scriptures that were turning within me as well, but I do believe that the focal point is going to be here. So you can turn with me. 1 John, the third chapter, and we're going to start from the 15th verse. And it, it begins to read, it says, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us, speaking of Jesus, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him, that individual that withholds the bowels of compassion? Put a highlight on that. And shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? My children, let us not Love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And if we can skip down <clears throat> to the 23rd verse, it begins to read. It says, and this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him. Talk about in the Lord Jesus. If you keep the, the commandments of the Lord as revealed to us through his word, it says you're dwelling in him. And the evidence of that is you're keeping and keep not just valuing his word, but applying oneself to obeying his word. And it says, and he in him, you're in him and he's in you. If you're doing what he says, according to his word and finished and closes by saying, and hereby we know that he abided in us, it is by or because of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that he had given unto us. And we thank God for his word, that his word is blessed. And may, uh, may God keep us and cause his engrafted word uh, to take us higher in him. What can I say this evening? Uh, this has been, the last seven weeks has been for me probably one of the most trying periods of time uh in, in recent memory in recent memory um just 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 really challenging i'll say a very challenging week and the reason why the week has been challenging is because everything that god speaks to me to minister to to you to minister to those who would listen the testing, the trying on each and every one of those bullet points. Like God give you a word and right at that word, like the Bible says the word is to the preacher first. Scripture said his word is nigh you, even in your mouth. But the word of God is first to the person who will declare it. It is first to that individual. That is the individual to whom the word of God was first delivered. The mailman is carrying the mail before he can deliver the mail. So the one who is delivering the mail or delivering the message is the one who is first to carry, is the one who is first held accountable. And so the reason I'm saying it's been so challenging is because all the, the, these tests have come back to back to back. It has just been so difficult, specifically in the workplace. Oh, my Lord, in the workplace or in the family as it pertaining to my, my, my son. And just just I mean, just stretched and pressed. And to be more specific, the the goal of the enemy in 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 the in the attack on me, and I'm saying this for reasons, it's gonna come together for a minute, bear with me. The goal of the enemy 
has definitely been on a daily basis to get me way out of character. To just get me out of character, out of character with the with the Christ who I know he, he has called me and anointed me to represent, to be an ambassador for him, to be a spokesman for him. I know that for a fact. I know that for a fact. Yet, 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, began to deal with Paul referring to those that he was talking to and said to them that we are, that we are, that we are epistles, that our lives are letters, essentially, that are being read by men is what the Apostle Paul was saying, that our lives are being read by men. You got people that won't pick up their Bible yet, but as soon as you mention the name of Jesus, specifically when you mention the name of Jesus, and you say that Jesus is the one that you are seeking to represent, they are reading your life. Before they read that Bible, they're reading your life. And the life that you live in front of people is gonna either lead you to Christ and properly represent him, or turn people away from Christ because of how Christ has been misrepresented, all right? And you can write that down as well, because that's a reference I believe you're going to want to come back to. 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, reading from, say, verse 2 to 4, speaking of how we, and I'll read it to you, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, he said, ye are, the apostle Paul said, ye are, you are our epistle, our letter written in our hearts, known and read of all men for as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle or the letter of Christ ministered by us right written not with ink but with the spirit of the living god not in tables of stone but in fleshly tables of the heart it is the engrafted word it is the word of God written in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that becomes the government of our lives. And notice I said it is be that becomes the government of our lives. Why? Because it is a process. We are going through a process. You may wonder how all of this ties together. Well, I'll tell you over the last three days, and I told you about what the warfare has been over the last week, over the last three days, through all the, the tests and the trials, Hearing the Lord speak to me, but going to work and just really feeling, going to work, getting phone calls regarding this and that and all, all kinds of stuff going on. But what I heard the Lord whisper to me over the last three, four days is make sure the doors of the church stay open. That's just what I was hearing. Make sure the doors of the church stay open. And when, when I heard those words, I literally began to visualize myself in, in the, in literally in a, in a building, in a building, say in a church that God would use me or a, a, a particular worship location that God would use me, a place of worship that God would use me to, to establish is what I was seeing while I was hearing the word of the Lord and, and getting this vision, he said, make sure the doors of the church stay open. But while he was speaking to me, I was angry. I was frustrated. I was pressed. Just, just really going through it. But yet, I heard the Lord say, but make sure the doors of the church stay open. And I was like, okay, well, Lord, I know I'm hearing you, but I'm not really sure what it is that you're trying, what it is that you're speaking to me. It's, it's, it, you know what you're saying to me, but I don't know that my understanding is fruitful. And then he comes again and he said, make sure the doors of the church stay open. And then I'm frustrated and I'm just angry. I mean, I'm sitting here and I'm talking to my GM and I'm frustrated. He's like, Brian, why are you so upset? And I couldn't even explain to him why I was so, why I had this feeling of intensity. Now pay attention to this. There are those of us that, such as myself and those of you who are watching that love the Lord that love him, love him with all your heart, love him with all your soul, your strength and your might. But there are times where it seems like the streets are getting the best of you, where it seems like the dust of you is prevailing. That is not the Holy Spirit in you that's prevailing or the word in you that's prevailing. Sometimes it seems like the flesh of you is getting the best of you. But yet I heard the Holy Spirit say, make sure the doors of the church stay open. The reality is, more than any word that we will speak, that we will preach, that we will sing, that we will say to people, 
The greatest display of who Christ is in our lives is how we treat the next man, how we treat our brothers, how we interact with people. Scriptures say, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God for everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God for God is love. The measurement, the gradient by which we will be recognizable and distinguishable as the disciples and followers and representatives of Jesus Christ is by the love that we display one for another. Now we got to get our hands, so to speak, dirty tonight. Because when we think about that first passage of scripture that I read to you, which was from 1 John chapter 3, whosoever hated this brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Think about this. Let's think about how offense affects what it is, the display of what it is that we just read. That how can we hate our brother and claim to be representatives of Christ? And you might say, well, I don't hate anyone, but sometimes we can interact with people in a way that is hateful. Let's, let's speak about offense, offensive that have taken place in our lives, different ones who have hurt us, different ones that have offended us. And at the point that the offense took place in our lives, what it resonated within us, it, it, it was a trauma. It was a trauma. It's like a person who's been in the midst of a gunfight, literally, like like like's been in, like's been near or has heard of a shootout. God forbid there's some people who have experienced that and they've been in the middle of a shootout. But then come forth of July, if they had their backs turned and they hear fireworks go off, they begin to associate the sound of the fireworks with the gunfire that they heard once upon a time. And they they hit in the deck, they dive and they roll and they run and because at the point that they were in the middle of that shootout, that they survived, the blessing is that they survived the shootout, but the difficulty is they are still dealing with the aftermath or the after effect of that trauma that they were exposed to. Are you following me, beloved? Offenses are, are like that with us. They're those of us who experience, who have experienced of, offense and trauma and abuse in relationships. And the difficulty then becomes to interact with those who were not responsible for the trauma. They weren't responsible for it. The people that we begin to interact with were not the ones who originally per se traumatized us. But yet we are tasked with displaying the love of God to individuals, not only when they're on their best behavior, because I think you'll agree when people are on their best behavior and they treat you nice, it's really easy. It's, it's, it's easy to show, to be nice to people who are being nice to you. Let's just, let's just put the cards on the table. We ain't trying to be, look, it's easy to be nice to people who are being nice to you. It's easy to be kind to people who are being kind to you. I'm talking about those of you who claim the name of Jesus and said, I'm trying to walk up light up rightly before him, Right? that you want to rightly represent him and you don't want to sacrifice your witness for him. You don't want to lay your witness for Christ Jesus on the altar of sacrifice and lose your witness and lose your opportunity. That, that, that aisle or that avenue of passage that would allow you to talk to somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ and how important and how vital he is in their lives. You don't want to lay that on the, on the altar for anything. But the reality is that's why offenses are so dangerous, unhealed, not just offenses. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Not just offenses, but the trauma that was caused by those offenses. The trauma that was caused by those offenses is what can create the difficulty. Because the trauma that is caused by those offenses will cause us to interact with people, especially, especially in the heat of the battle, especially in the heat of of, of, of traumatic situations and arguments and things like that. And you say you have disagreements. You're going to have disagreements with people. We are going to have disagreements with people. It's going to happen. You're not going to always agree on points, but guess what? There is the expectation that those of us who are believers in Christ Jesus are going to stay in character. What does that mean? To stay close and akin and to hold on to the character of Christ Jesus and who he is and who we are supposed to represent before men, despite the fact that we have a disagreement with the individual. 
But based on trauma, based on trauma and based on the trauma that was caused by the offenses that we have experienced, the reality is, is according to, let's look here at this verse right here, verse 17, 1 John chapter 3, verse 17, but whoso have this world's good and see if his brother have need and shut, shut it up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? Now you might say to yourself, well, you know, it's not that I desire to do anything harm or it's not that I desire any harm to come to this individual. But the reality is sometimes, beloved, we allow ourselves to get out of character to the degree that there is a roadblock in terms of us being able to minister the message of Christ Jesus to an individual that we have had an agreement that we have had a disagreement with. And sometimes. If the truth is told, we're just putting it all on the table tonight. If the truth be told, many times we are reacting to people, not necessarily according to, to the severity of what they did. Sometimes the way that you react to people and the, and the sort of, of, of aggression and volatility that you feel about certain things is not necessarily because of what that person did. Mm -mm. What it really is, is what that person, the, the thing that that person did or the thing that that person said, what it puts you in the mind of that you experienced that they did not do. Are y'all with me? I'm going to say that again. Sometimes we sitting here about to flip on this person, not necessarily because of the severity of what they did. It wasn't that it was that deep. But it puts you in the mind of those things that were that deep that we have not completely healed from. Let me tell you, covered wounds will never heal. And that is why the Lord is saying unto us tonight that we ought to bring these things, these offenses, and the trauma that has been caused by these offenses to the altar, to the altar, to the altar, to the altar, to the altar. To the altar. We have to bring these traumas and these offenses the, the trauma that was caused by these offenses, we have to bring these things to the altar. But we won't bring these things to the altar if we're not willing to be honest. There is a misconception that dwells in the minds of those individuals who would sit in a place like myself, like, okay, but Lord, I believe that your hand is on me to preach the gospel. And that may be very true. God's hand is on you to preach the gospel. But because his hand is on you to preach the gospel, that doesn't make you immune to the things that are going on in this world. The apostle Paul said it best. He said, I have to keep my flesh up under the subjection. He said, lest after I've gone and preached to, to preach to others that I become a castaway. And then comes back to me the word that the Lord has been speaking to me over the last four days. Make sure the doors of the church stay open. And then begin to elaborate and says, what would happen if, if just because a person in the congregation offended you, are you going to put them out of the church simply because they offended you? We're not talking about per se, you know, insubordinate or a proven pattern of disrespect or disregard for leadership. I mean, those things have to be dealt with, you know what I mean? And a parting of ways may be necessary. But simply because an individual did something that you didn't like or may said something you didn't like, the reaction can't be, can't be, can't always be, or I'm going to clip somebody, I'm going to cut somebody off. I'm going to shut a person off from the bowels of mercy and compassion that would be manifested through, through ministering unto them. We can't allow ourselves to get so twisted with what somebody has said or done till that avenue is not there for us to share Christ with them. Is really what's being stated tonight. When we talk about let the doors of the church stay open. If what is written in 2 Corinthians is true. And again, that reference is 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, starting from the second verse. If we are indeed, as the writer, the apostle Paul said, living epistles to be read of men. If, if our lives for periods of time are the only Bible per se that people are reading. If that be the case, we can never allow offense and the trauma that these offenses have caused to get us to the degree 
to get us to, a, to the degree that we are not recognizable or distinguishable as the children of the Most High God, to the degree that we cannot share Christ with them. Because anytime you get so offended and twisted with what somebody has done to you, you can't share Christ with them, that means the root of bitterness has begun to take place. And that's something that we have to pray. We have to pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you. I come before you, Lord, with the wounds, acknowledging the wounds that I have sustained by way of manifold offenses. And Father, these offenses are causing me to react to people in a way that does not represent you. These, these offenses are causing me, Lord God, to show myself angry when I don't need to be showing myself angry. You said be angry, but sin not. Lord, Lord there, 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 are, there, are, there are roots of bitterness, oh God, that, that have been their seeds of bitterness that I'm beginning to recognize are showing themselves. By the way, I'm responding to people literally as the saying goes, I find myself bleeding on people that didn't cut me. And if they did cut me and if they did scratch me, it certainly was not like unto the, the it was not like unto the gash or the wound that was caused by the original trauma. We've got to go to the root of where this stuff came from. Oh, Lord, have mercy. The Bible said, for let a man examine himself. Another portion of scripture said, confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. Confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. A covered wound is never going to heal. We're talking about as representatives of Jesus Christ, offensive that offenses that have taken place in our lives and the trauma of these offenses, what effect are these offenses having on our witness before, before, the, before the world? Because guess what? If we win the argument, but we lose the privilege of being able to share Christ with that individual. We didn't win anything. We didn't win. We didn't win anything. The Bible says a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. You know it's true. If you go, if you go, if you get out of character and cuss somebody clean out, which we really shouldn't be doing as believers anyway. And but ain't, <laughs> there's some words that really should not be coming out of our mouths. But even if no profanity was involved, if you come at somebody in an offensive way and you might be right, your point, your your position may be the right position. But sometimes even in the you can have the right position, but to but you are delivering messages from that right position in the wrong way. And you are cutting someone so deep, even in the truth, even though you have an accurate and your position is true. They were wrong. They were wrong, but sometimes we deal with the wrong in a way that is wrong. Does that make sense? And how do I know that? If we are dealing with the wrong as ambassadors, as representatives of Jesus Christ, if we're dealing with the wrong or the offenses of other people against us in a way that destroys our ability to effectively minister to them, we have lost the battle. This is why Jesus said, Jesus was saying to his disciples, he said, leave your gift at the altar and be reconciled to your brother. Leave your gift at the altar and be reconciled to your brother. And I'm going to tell y'all the truth. I needed some help. Let me tell you, Jesus had to throw out the lifeline for me lately. He had to throw out the lifeline for me because this, this example that I'm thinking of, it didn't have to do with me seeking out my brother. It had to do with my brother coming and seeking me. Come and, and literally for the purposes of reconciliation. The Bible said it is given unto each of us as believers in Christ Jesus, the ministry of reconciliation. And I can think, and this is a conversation I recently had with the individual. Here's what's crazy. As I began to sit and listen to the sister talk to me and share her heart with me, I realized that the way that I was reacting to her it really wasn't her I was reacting to. It wasn't her I was reacting to. It wasn't what she did that was so grave that I was reacting to. What I was reacting to was what it reminded me of that I had been through. And it hurt me to know. It hurt me to know. As, as accurate, listen, you can hear the word of the Lord so accurately. You can hear the word of the Lord and it be bullseye accurate for somebody else. 
But if I'm hearing the word of the Lord for somebody else and I'm but I'm missing it for me, that's that's a problem. But the blessing is being able to acknowledge that that is the case, to be able to acknowledge that truth. What are we talking about? The dem the greatest demonstration of the love of Christ Jesus in and through us is not just what we say, but is what we demonstrate to people. Love is something that can love is something that has to be demonstrated. My mother used to always say love is an action word. And indeed it is. And indeed it is. And indeed it is. Love is something that has to be demonstrated. It has to be demonstrated to people. It has to be demonstrated. The Lord doesn't want us to be preaching to people about his love, but walking in straight anger. You know, that's not what the Lord wants for us. But nothing about that condition is going to change until we're willing to acknowledge where we have been wounded. Because those reactions that cause us to come out of character like that and to speak the way that we speak and to take that posture that we take at times, it has to do with offenses and things that have happened and trauma that has not completely healed. And we have to be willing to acknowledge that tonight. All right. As I want to read this scripture down, I'm just going to read it one more time, if you don't mind. First John chapter three, verse 15, whosoever hated this brother is a murderer and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in here. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good and see if his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? How? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. We're going down to verse 23. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. The presence of the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit does not mean that we cannot point out and recognize and deal with what has taken place. The love of God being present in our hearts does not mean that we live in a perpetual state of denial. Are you hearing that, beloved? You don't have to deny what happened by yourself or in the presence of the offender. But true ministry begins to take place when we can deal with the offender and we can speak the truth in love. If we speak the truth by way of carnal antics and gestures and expressions, if we speak the truth in flesh, bad things can happen. You can tell somebody the truth in a way that will that will scar them for the rest of their life. That we have to speak the truth in love. But it takes, listen, it takes prayer and separation and time of consecration in the presence of the Lord to draw, to gather his strength, to pull from the well that is Christ Jesus, to literally have the discipline to be able to speak the truth of love and speak a word in season, even to those who have taken a position of offense against us. Where does it begin? The healing begins at the point of confession and acknowledgement to confess in the presence of the Lord. And even those accountability partners that you may have, even those accountability, I'm so sorry, y'all, those accountability partners that you may have in your life. The reality is we need to be able to speak truthfully, not just about our strengths, but we need to be, be able to speak truthfully about our weaknesses and where we need more grace in our lives. That may be the very thing that compels the individual that's scrutinizing your life and reading your life like a letter. The fact that you would confess where you have needed more grace in your life may be the very thing that once that draws them closer to the feet. Of Jesus Christ, even as we pray, Father, we come now in Jesus name. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you that daily you are perfecting us, though the outward man perish, that the inward man is renewed day by day. We thank you for the supply of your spirit. 
We thank you for the light that your word shines upon our lives to point out the good, the bad, and the ugly. Thank you, oh God, that you are beautiful for situation and you are able to save to the uttermost, oh God, those who have been sanctified by your spirit. It is your perfection, not ours. Though the outward man perishes, the inward man is renewed day by day. And we thank you for this truth and your word that causes us to acknowledge where we need to grow in grace. Oh my God, we thank you for saving us. We thank you for healing us. We thank you for delivering us. We thank you for filling us, hallelujah, and sealing us even unto the day of redemption. That even though, oh God, we have errors, we have been, as the writer said, perplexed, but not forsaken, oh God, cast down, but not destroyed. Oh my God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that even though we have lost some battles, Father God, you won the war for us and you sealed it in blood. We give you glory to encourage somebody, oh God, and to cause us, oh God, to draw near to your word, oh God, that is able, oh God, to transform us, oh God, that we would be made complete in you, Lord Jesus, who is the head of all principality and power. God, we give you all of the glory and the honor for the wonders that you're working in our life through Christ Jesus. Amen.